It is May the 7th, 2022. I'm Chris, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. And we're back, and we, that is myself and Adrian. Hello, Adrian. Hello, how are you? I'm doing good. How's your How's your life? We haven't... We haven't, well, we, we've talked last week, but uh, then we I took a break, and now Jeremiah is not here, and we're... It's a mix and match kind <laughs> of situation right now, so... It, it is. This is why we have a team of people on the podcast, isn't it? Because, you know, in any one week, it's pro high probability two people can turn up, but, uh, yeah... <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's uh yeah life life is okay thank you although i have a a sad story to tell for today's oh, podcast no. <laughs> well and maybe and maybe a request to our listeners to to help me out a little bit with some ideas so that's uh more, more to come though on that though i think because i think you've got something for us first haven't you well it's it's um it, i've been well we've been talking about dali Dali D A L L dash E to the AI that creates photography by just asking it to do so. Um, and Jeremiah and I had a had an episode about this, and I've I've done such a deep dive on what it is, what it can do, what it cannot do, and um, we could probably make this into an extra episode. But um, just a couple of things that I found that are really interesting that I didn't really anticipate and that is two main criticisms of DALI 2 that I mean if you look at it if you go um, if you look at all the that there's like a subreddit and there's Twitter hashtags that where, where, where people who are already on that public well semi-public beta um, where they fulfill requests so people send them a prompt they feed it into DALI 2 and let's say a monkey with a pink hat eating spaghetti in <laughs> in uh, Switzerland or something like that and and then creates that for them and posts it back to that subreddit or on Twitter and so on so you have a whole bunch of interesting like uh, uh, things to look at and it is quite mind-blowing what it does and how it does it and what comes out and I'm still convinced that the implications of Dali are going to be amazingly big and oh, it's not sure. the yeah, and it's not the only uh, neural net that does these kind of things. So there are other competing ones, and we, we're looking at, a, at an explosion in size, in capabilities um, that is happening right now. And we will um, it will it will change things. It will influence a lot of things. So I'm I'm um, naturally that that's how I'm inclined. I look at this and I'm very giddy. I'm like, oh, this is exciting, and it's also going to be <laughs> it's also kind of scary because of all the potential implications on different um, jobs and maybe even on the livelihood of people. So um, like stock photographers, meh, it's going to be tough for them in the future with these kind of systems around. Um, but there are two criticisms that I um, came across and I, I talked to a, a German artist who is who uses computers a lot. Um, not in that kind of fashion, more in a in a, a developing algorithms that create art kind of fashion. So okay. we are looking at a traditional programming more, not, not AI where you have these training data sets and so on. But um, she brought two interesting points to the table. And the first is, um, is the source data. Where does this data come from? Ooh, good question. Public sources, that's what they say. And uh, it, per it definitely means um, things that are... Well, the question is, uh, how are those licenses upheld, if at all? Um, we're talking 650,000 images, uh, 650 million images that have been gone into training that data set. So, uh, and where did they come from? That's interesting. There's a lot yeah, of scraping going on in the web. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the question is, do you have any pictures online that have been used in there? Did you give any consent? <laughs> of your photography, of your online photography being used for that. So that's a, that's a valid criticism that I think needs to be looked into. Um, and the second one um, is one that generally most AIs that generate things um, that applies to those. And that is 
um, that there are biases in data sets. Oh, well, we've certainly we've talked about that quite a lot, haven't yes. we? Yes. Um, and so, so if you if you ask Dali, give me five pictures of lawyers. Those will very likely be male lawyers, um, even though the English language doesn't gender. And uh, the same is for like there are, there are as many examples as you like that uh, that show a bias that comes from the data set. Um, including being very Western centric and very um, stereotype centric, so you have the, you you find all the stereotypes in there that you can think of, and if you want something that does not adhere to those stereotypes, you have to do the work and um, and provide the proper prompts. Like specify, yeah, specify in the prompts. So, so if you of, wanted, for example, of female a picture lawyers, of a, yeah. a female lawyer, or yeah, or, yes. or an Asian female lawyer, or, or something like that. There we go. Yeah, there we go. So, so those mm. are the two things that I find interesting, and that um, will certainly get some more uh, scrutiny before Dali comes out, if at all. I mean, Dali, the first Dali version, isn't available. So um, that's not not to the public. Um, OpenAI's GPT-3 language model, which writes articles and these kind of things, um, I think it's been around for a couple of years now, or at least a year, and uh, it's still in a sort of a beta test. So they are still they still have not made that available for um, for public or commercial use, uh, as far as I know. So. There, there's a lot of testing going on right now and a lot of, ga I think, a lot of gauging of implications and what that really means if it gets into the hands of, like, everyone. And we're, we're of course, yeah. we're talking misinformation, fake news, these kind of things. There's uh, plenty of uh, dystopian scenarios that we can come up with if we want, if you want to. If Jeremiah was here, that would be all the dystopian scenarios <laughs> at once. Well, you know, I, I, it, it's hard sometimes to avoid those, isn't it? Oh, so, totally, uh, yeah, totally. It happens to me too, so. Totally, and that's why um, uh, you have suggested something that is very, very, that, that has a little, very little con contro controversy potential, um, and that is cameras. Well, I'd like to think so. Um, this is, so, so this week, this is a, this is a very, fu excuse me, a very personal future of photography uh, this week, because um, uh, after we recorded last week's episode, uh, the next day or so later, uh, we went out for the day, and uh, I left my camera on a train. Um, and why and for those just it? listening, <laughs> for those just listening, um, there's no air quotes around that. That's not like I deliberately abandoned it or it's stolen uh -huh. or anything like that. I literally left it on a train um, and it equally it was not an act of desperation to justify buying a new camera. Um, that's not where this is coming from. I just left my camera. Don't, on don't a you train, think there was some, is, some sub subconscious uh, component there? <laughs> No, I don't think so. I think it's mostly because I fell asleep on the train and then I also had a cup of coffee in my hand and I was trying to shepherd my kids around and stuff like that. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's sense, just yes. life. Just life intervened and life intervened and separated me from my camera, mostly because of my own negligence and stupidity, <sighs> I think. So, which, which uh, one was it? What camera was it? Well, this is, uh, this is my Olympus Tough. Uh, TG4, the one that I carry around with me everywhere. Right. So in some sense, it, that's good news, right? Because that's an old camera. Uh, it's not worth very much. Um, so it, so in that sense, um, you know, it's good news. But it's also one that I use most days, and uh, and you know, it, so it's it, it's one that I miss, um, hmm. which is sad. So I, it's, I'm still not uh, not not out of uh, the, the time period where I might get it back. Uh, the, the train companies do operate a lost property service, which sometimes can get take a week or so to come into effect. So this happened the, as we were recording the this. Camera, about, the camera is old enough that whoever finds it is not going to want to keep it anyway. Quite possibly, quite, <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is good news in itself, isn't it? So in, oh. I might get it back in a few days. But of course, in the meantime, um, my mind has turned to, well, what would I replace it with? And so that's what I'm asking for some help from our listeners today. Yeah, what so, kind okay. of cameras? Let me let me let, let me let me talk about the elephant in the room here, because um, of course there is this thing in everyone's pocket right now, which is <laughs> uh, 
which which has one, two, three cameras pointing in one direction and another camera pointing the four cameras in this little device, which is always on me, which has sensational quality for what it does. Um, lots of processing built in. So uh, I know I asked you this question before, but there will be listeners asking this question right now. Why, <laughs> why don't you just use the smartphone that is a very decent camera? It is, isn't it? A uh, really good question. Um, and for me, um, it boils down to the, the fun and ergonomic element uh mostly but also a, a, some um some capture or, or artistic elements uh so i prefer much prefer uh to use a dedicated compact camera um uh, that's you know i find it easier i find it is uh less friction between the you know, between me capturing the image that i i have in my head like the thing that i see um, I like that the cam the dedicated camera has a, a zoom lens. My phone doesn't have a telephoto lens. Mm, okay. um, so I, I like that the camera has a zoom lens, um, which gives me a little bit more flexibility. Uh, I, uh, I I think that so so that's that's something and I, I just you know, I, I quite happily you know put my phone in my pocket and away and 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 hold to just in one hand a compact camera that is mostly operable with one hand which is actually quite tricky to take a photograph with your phone with just one hand right yeah you have yeah. to be a bit of a contortionist to get this right you do yeah, yeah. and so it, it, it's you know it's a very personal thing and it's very subjective right yeah yeah absolutely right. no uh, no reason i couldn't or shouldn't use my phone um and now that i don't have a pocketable camera for a while I, that's exactly what i have been doing i mean um, you would but, you would probably it would be very unlikely for you to leave it on a train because you just don't do this with a phone that's true there there is that yes thanks for that <laughs> But okay, I, I see your reasons. You you do have your reason, and that is totally valid and totally fine. So, uh, yes. you are looking for a replacement camera. Where, where, what, what have you? What were your thoughts in this uh, direction? So this is the, the this is the replacement needs to be something that is small and light, uh, ideally pocketable. And when I say pocketable, ideally, you know, put it in your trouser pocket, right? Not just a big coat pocket in the winter. You know, here it's getting into the nicer part of the year now like for the weather. We, we have to specify front pocket. And it's a, a male pair of pants. <laughs> those pockets are definitely bigger than female pants. That's that's true. Uh, although it could be a rear pocket. I mean, so so you know, I, so you know, if for rear pocket, it also needs to have. It needs to be set onable to a certain amount. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't do that. I would take it out of my pocket if I, I was see, to okay. sit down. But just but making the, sure we have all the all the all the parameters. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be the same as what I've had in the past. So, you know, I'm not. Okay. Yeah, uh, but but the things that I liked about the, the camera that I've lost uh, is that uh, it is very small. Um, uh, it does fit in, the, in, in a pocket. Um, uh, even it doesn't have a lens that sticks out. Um, it's all built into the body with that particular camera. So for those that don't know it, the Olympus Tough cameras are. Uh, yeah, they're they're the waterproof and drop proof cameras, um, and nothing sticks out. There's there's a uh, the lens doesn't zoom out when you switch it on. Um, you know the the shell of the camera stays the same, um, which is what makes it tough, right? It's there's nothing yeah, exactly. that can break off pretty much. Nothing to break off exactly. Yeah, so so that means it stays small in operation uh, as well. But that again, that's that's not something that is. Is, is something I like, but it's not something that is a, an absolute must-have for a different camera. But uh, yeah, I do like the, the toughness. But again, on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't make use of that. I mean, it is also the the camera that you know you once you put the the flotation device wrist strap on it, you can literally throw it in the sea, and I have done that. It's a weird feeling to do that. Um, on purpose I'm sure I or accidentally. Oh no! On purpose. No, you okay. can you can throw it. You know, imagine you're you're sailing, not the not the sort of you know Svalbard sailing that you do, but you know somewhere in the Mediterranean or a little bit nicer. You know, you can you can you can throw it off a boat into the sea and it will float. You know, uh, and the salt water doesn't hurt the camera. And I do like that about it, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I don't use that feature every day. Uh, sadly, I don't live in a yacht on the Mediterranean. Um, <laughs> <sighs> 
so so I, I'm thinking about what categories a camera here and you know few 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 things and like pro, uh, pros and cons advantages disadvantages that kind of thing um and uh, so there's a few here you know to talk about and just have a think about and I'd be interested in your opinions Chris as well as everybody else's sure absolutely let's let's go let's go through a list of cameras what let's go through a list of cameras to... okay well, I think the the place to start for me uh, on this list is the high quality do it all camera, uh, and I think the best current expression of this probably is the Sony RX one hundred line of cameras. What a series of cameras! What a, what a line of cameras! I mean, that's, when this first came out, it was like it, it was a. I think it was a game changer, just in terms of. Uh, image quality and size and the combination of the entire package yeah it, it's it's incredible what they can fit into that isn't it um and uh, there's there are good reasons um i've played with one in the past but i've never actually used one properly um uh, the, there's good reasons why these these cameras are, have had a long lifetime currently on the seventh generation uh of the basically the same can, camera can you turn your phone off it's uh, it's interfering with the sound a bit um, or move it to the side. I can. It was nowhere near any of the sound things, but hopefully oh. that helped. It's, it's better now. So RX100. Yeah, so the RX100, there, there's a reason uh, that these things have had a, a good long lifetime and they remain popular as currently on the seventh generation. I mean, they can do most things and actually they still sell some of the older models so that you can even choose do you want the super long slightly slower lens or the or the slightly shorter zoom faster yeah. lens versions you know they have a uh, they and they do video and they do you know they do good pictures you know good photographs good video all sorts of stuff um it feels a bit clinical to me it's a sony it feels, Sony's a are like a computer. Yes, it's a Sony. Then Sony's are like that mostly. Um, I the, my next question for about the RX one hundred would be ergonomics because it doesn't have a grip, does it? It's more like a no. I don't pill, not, not a pill big shaped one. kind of thing from, from yeah. the top, and uh, um, I, I, I think it would be one handable, but. Um, it has things coming out, so when you turn it on, the lens goes bzzz, and then if you use the flash, it goes click and comes out. So it has like these attachments that come out. Yeah. So that's it does have just a, one it thing. Does have I have a viewfinder though as well, which I like the idea of that's having a, a viewfinder. Yeah. Um, yes. Although having said that, which until very recently I would have said in a new camera for me would have probably been a necessity because I'd gotten to the point where I couldn't really see the screen on the back of the cameras very well. Uh, but having recently had surgery to correct my eyesight... That fixed um, everything, find, didn't it? <laughs> uh, that's fixed, yeah. I, I have really good short field vision now. Um, yeah. So um, it, actually, I find myself less worried about whether a camera has a viewfinder in it or not. Um, Is it? So, isn't, for, for, for me, there's a huge difference between using a viewfinder and using a screen that, that I look at when I take pictures. And there's nothing to do with eyesight, but just with the... I feel more in the picture when I use a viewfinder. It's more like yes. being in a cinema, in a, in a room where I look at something versus... Uh, I, I'm, I'm not in the same space when I look through a viewfinder than when I look at a picture. Uh, agreed. Al although for me, I would add to that uh, that um, the, the viewfinder, the, especially the size uh, of the viewfinder, makes a huge difference. Oh, yes. So, so a, a small, tiny viewfinder is... is almost for me personally as much of a distraction is it as a benefit yeah. whereas if when you fall into the viewfinder of a good size medium format slr <laughs> uh you know that that's something you could yeah that that's a that's a um, an amazing experience so the okay. yeah uh but anyway so so there's there's that kind of thing yeah the downsides against a camera like that yeah maybe it's a bit computerish rather than camera-ish certainly right. they're expensive uh, you wouldn't want to leave oh, yes. one of those on a train. <laughs> well, that that might help you avoid leaving it on a train because you always have have the price in the back of your mind. Well, maybe, maybe. Um, I, I, th I have to say, this is the first time anything like this has ever happened to me. I've never done this. I've never lost a camera before, at least not that I can recall. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping I've it's lost, a once. I've lost a fifty millimeter lens once, and uh, then I rebought it, and then 
uh, about almost a year later, I found the first one again in a, an old <laughs> camera bag that I that where it was shoved into a corner of the oh, thing, wow, and okay. uh, so now I have two. There you go. Well, at least it was only a fifty mil, and not say so yeah, like a really expensive zoom lens or something. Oh yeah, no, that that was that was a kind of that, it, it was okay. Anyway, the RX100, what yes. else did you put on the list? What else? Well, the the other thing is, is I really do like, um, in the camera that I had, I really do like the zoom function, as I said. So another category I'm looking at is is the travel zoom. Um, the example I've put here in the show notes is, is uh, uh, I was going for what's the most ludicrous zoom I could possibly find <laughs> in a tiny <laughs> pocketable camera. I think this one goes to an equivalent of something like 720 millimeters. <laughs> okay in in a in a camera that when it's all turned off it all folds away and put the, and fits in your pocket i mean it does that of course by having a very small sensor as much as anything else but um this is a panasonic uh, the panasonic tz travel zoom uh 95 which seems to be the the current thing that panasonic are, are pushing for their mega zoom i think they call it um so that was an interesting idea i think um I don't really have a concept of what it means to shoot at 720 millimeters because I don't think, never had a lens that long before. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether it would be fun or, or, or useless or, or creatively brilliant or what. I have no idea. Um, so yeah, I'd but be interested. As, as long as long as you have, haven't had this, you yeah, I think you with as with many things, you need to have the experience using it to including focal lengths uh, in order to understand what they can do for you or if you need them at all. And yeah, the, the result yes. might as well be, meh, I don't need it. It might be. It might be. It might be that it, I don't, I don't you know, find any use for it in the slightest. So I said, this one is, I think it could be fun. It would be, it would allow, it would allow me to experiment with composition in a way that perhaps I haven't been able to do before because I haven't had the, the reach um, certainly in a walking around lens, uh, it would be a walking around camera. Um, it would give me, I don't know what it would give me, opportunities to do crazy stuff. But oh, you, you, might tur- be- you might turn into a bird photographer and not shoot anything else from now on. It's like little <laughs> But only birds sparrows that are five miles away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I, I know people who, who, who I've, I've, I've got this question, what should I buy to shoot pictures of the birds in my backyard? from the house because if i get yeah. closer and they fly away so you know that that's the kind of thing uh, in a compact form that would probably serve that purpose yeah hey, but yes actually yeah good good point good point okay so next category up is is your action cam your gopro kind of thing yeah. um so the hot yeah the hot my stuff. Yeah, I mean, I don't shoot a lot of video, so uh, I, I'm not so much keen on this for the, from a, a videoing point of view. Um, so maybe it's not the camera for me in that sense. But I understand that many of these action cams shoot really passable stills these days. What, what, do, what do they do in terms of um, a resolution? Are we talking 12 megapixels, 20 megapixels? Oh, that's a good question. Or as a still I photo. I mean, if, if I shoot with my smartphone, that's... Uh, at this point, there's a 12 megapixel photo, which yes. is plen- plenty for what I need, unless I want to do a real, uh, a real deep crop of sorts. But I'm, yeah, I'm happy with plenty, anything plenty around 10, 12, 16 megapixels. I don't right. really want any more than that, to be honest. I'm trying to find um, specs here on the website, I can't see anything. Okay, it doesn't so, matter. That so, much. I mean, even if it topped out at 4K, that's roughly eight megapixels, isn't it? So. Yeah. Um, so uh, it would be a, yeah a bit more than eight megapixels. Maybe nine megapixels is four K, isn't it? So um, that would be enough for me. Um, so uh, yeah, it's just a, it's just a thought. It was just a thought, really. I I I think this possibly is that is something to add to the list for the sake of some diversity in the list, rather than oh, because I have a huge interest in it. Um, but I didn't think a list of compact cameras would be complete without having an action cam in it. Yeah, that yeah. is a, a very popular category these days. Um, uh, not sure it's the one for me, um, but we'll see. Ergonomics, I mean, it's a small cube. You can just point at things and 
squeeze and then it yeah. does. Or, or actually, you can talk to them. You can say, uh, GoPro, take a picture. No, it will do it. <laughs> Great. Another thing yeah. I can talk to. Smashing. Well, um, I, so, I, I've, I've, I've seen a guy who does like um, videos with GoPro when, he's, when he drives. And uh, those videos, every now and then they just stop. And then he comes back cursing because something he said <laughs> triggered it and stopped oh, it. Really? <laughs> it's like, a, it's like a Siri, Alexa and Co. They are, yeah. sometimes they just go off. So, yes. Okay. So, well, I mean, the action cams are there. Uh, do I think action cam is for me? Probably not. Um, but then that's the sort of action cam video world, isn't it? The, ne the next category up is is uh, the tough camera category. Yeah, that, that was uh, which, my question. Why, why don't you just go for the same type of camera again that you lost? Well, it's on the it's on the list here. So the current generation of the Olympus Tough camera is the TG6. It's been out for I think about four years, maybe three, four years. Um, but no no sign of there being a a new version of it. And of course, Olympus cameras have gone through a change of ownership since this camera was brought out. So who knows where that will take us? Um, I have to say, it is a it is a, a hot contender uh, on this list um, because they are quite affordable. Um, it's something that I know how to use and I know that it works for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't seem to me particularly like the adventurous choice because I've had one for years. But you, but <laughs> yeah, you, get, so, you get the, you get the, all the accessories I see like, a, a an underwater housing here and things yeah. like that. So you, you would be set for, for a, for an active adventurous lifestyle with that. I would. So there's so there's some good things here, right? Which is um, uh, one of the things I love about the, these cameras is their macro capability. Um, oh, okay. I don't really have another camera that can shoot macro. Uh, and these Olympus Tough cameras can focus one centimeter away from the subject. Um, they they have incredible, uh, incredible macro capability um, and all in, uh, you know, and again, all, all in a, a very, very small package. So you get a, a zoom. I don't even know what the zoom is. It, it says it's two times, but two times what? I have no idea. And then there's a, like, you can go beyond that as well. So I think it's probably a 28 to 70 lens or something like that. But, it, you know, it, there, there is some zoom, but you can also do it uh, in uh in you know, use use it for macro uh there as you say there are lots of accessories for it which can which can make it fun so you can get you know a flash diffuser that fits on the front of it that would help with lighting macro stuff um i already have a bunch of uh, stuff as well that will work with it like a case like spare batteries you know like a flotation wrist strap so so i have that would the, uh, it would, is very would tempting the case of the old ones still fit the new one or probably not uh so the the style of case i've got is a, is a, is a, oh, it's, it's is a sort of bungee type case right so it's I it's see. it's it's sort of strap it to your belt and bungee the camera into it so yeah i think it probably would um but uh they, they haven't changed in shape that much over the generations i don't think so that's 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 one uh, and it's definitely got to be right up there as a as a contender um, because you know, I know and love that line of cameras. So, uh, and it has all the things I'm looking for, um, but maybe not the most adventurous choice. Which brings me on to something that would be more adventurous, which is, uh, as we all know, there is a, there's a, a big movement these days for what we might call classic digi cams. These are yeah. There's a lot going on in on YouTube and people who perhaps a few years ago might be have been looking at film camera point and shoots, but those are now out of their budget range. Now looking at you know digi cams, small point and shoot digital cameras from ten years or so ago. And, so these you know, this would be this would be what we would classify as like compact cameras. Yeah, so essentially, so. yeah. And, and you know, if you think about what the camera market was like ten years ago, there were a million of these things to choose from. True. Um, uh, so uh, I've put one here in uh, in the uh, show notes, uh, which is uh, called the Canon S100, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, as I recall, was uh, an incredibly popular camera when it was re released um, and got good reviews, and you know, uh, and you know, it would seem to be perhaps a a very affordable way to leave a camera on a train. <laughs> so you're you're making that camera a disposable item. Right. Mm, 
So <laughs> do, do you know what? Yes and yes and no. No, I mean I wouldn't intentionally treat it badly, even if it was a, a used camera that was ten years old. I'd still want to look after it, and I'd still want to you know, keep 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 hold of it. The one that really intrigues me, which I th- I think probably fails. I so I haven't put it in the show notes here. But do you remember the Nikon One series of cameras? Yes, I do. So their own mount and everything yes mm-hmm. they had their own mount so so this was a one inch camera again so so a bit like you know the the sony rx100 line a bit like some of the travel zooms not the one that we linked in the, in the show notes but panasonic right. makes some travel zooms with a one inch camera canon make quite a few uh compact cameras with a one inch sensor um, so Nikon had their own in about 10 years ago. Uh, they released this um, and they re- released it as an interchangeable lens camera and brought out a small range of lenses for it with their own mount and their own sensor and things like that. Um, I still like the idea of having one of those. But sadly, I don't think it's really fit in your jeans pocket kind of size because the lenses are bigger than that. Um, so that's uh, but they are really, really cheap. These cameras these days. If anybody wants to go play and fancies an entirely new camera system to go play, I looked up how much it would cost to buy a Nikon One system, and you could buy the uh, the the higher spec first generation camera in decent enough condition for about seventy five pounds. So okay. about hundred hundred euros, something dollars. The lenses range anywhere from about fifty pounds to several hundreds of pounds, depending on which lens you buy. But you could buy a, a kit zoom lens and a pancake prime lens uh, and a camera, all for probably less than two hundred pounds. So you could get yourself a whole compact system there, you know, for, for running around with and playing with. What 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 it looks like it uh, what what it's like to operate and what the photos look like, but yeah, you know, by today's standards, I have no idea. But it sounds like fun. <laughs> Okay, so any more on the list? No, I think that's about okay. it. What about you? Got any got any ideas? Have I missed it? That's the thing. I, I, I tried to put together a list of different categories. Have I missed any categories? Well, okay, I, I have to get back to the smartphone just for a minute because okay. you, 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 you very deliberately... Um, you, it's, it's almost like, like you're... you're um, you, you, you have made this a... A blind spot for yourself, and uh, I <laughs> see. I see. Well, first of all, I have an iPhone 13 Pro, and that does have. It doesn't zoom, as in, well, it simulates zoom, but it has three cameras, and it goes from ultra wide angle. That's a, a 13 millimeter equivalent through the what they call wide angle, which is 26 millimeters up. It has a telephoto lens that has an equivalent of 77 millimeters. So. It is a nice portrait uh, focal length and yep. gives you zoom in. And the way the, the interface works is it does look like it does a smooth zoom, even though it just does some digital magic to make it seem like it. But it, yeah. it it's decent. It has an amazing processing built-in. Um, and if you if you look for ergonomics, I do agree that the ergonomics aren't great. But if I just Google iPhone photo grip... There is a whole mm, there bunch are of different there, yes. uh, grips out there that you can hook up that will either uh, click into the port and, uh, and trip the shutter this way, or they will use Bluetooth and automatically connect. So there's a whole bunch of helpers that make your iPhone or smartphone for that matter, but iPhone I think has the biggest ecosystem uh, yeah. in, in that regard. We, we'll make that iPhone uh, feel like proper camera and for for camera operation itself you have is amazing the amazing the big amount of different types of apps that serve all different kinds of needs yeah. and the built-in one is very good so uh, the, and that one is e- easy to reach so it is there it's in your pocket and if you put a small grip on it that gives it a camera view you could probably leave that on and Maybe even have an extra battery in there that extends your your camera's battery, uh, your smartphone's battery life. So I would not discount a modern high spec smartphone because they do have very decent uh, lenses, cameras, and uh, photography. To- totally agree. I I happen to have at the moment the iPhone 13 Mini. Yes. So which is I have nice that- and small. Yes. 
it is yeah it definitely fits in a trouser pocket that one um i uh it has the wide angle length the the, the super wide or whatever it is that they call it and the wide angle lens which is i think i think it's a 26 27 something like that equivalent it uh, doesn't have mine doesn't have the telephoto lens so it is missing that bit um i have to say though that i am not a fan of the computational processing the aesthetic of the computational processing in the iphone and well, because so much of the image quality relies on that computational I, um uh i've not in a actually i've not i've not when i had the iphone 12 pro max i was not a fan of the basic raw you could get out of it with apps like halide either um although actually with the 13 mini uh, it's not even capable of raw um, yeah, so, you, you will need a pro version of it. And the 13 Pro Max does Apple Pro Raw, which I've uh, used extensively for photos. Yeah, I, the 12 I, Pro Max had Pro Raw as well, and I did use oh. Pro Raw. And uh, yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was better, I suppose. But I, you know, it's I always felt like I was having to unpick the processing to get the result I wanted, which kind of is like. So, so you're you're also okay. So the processing is another factor of it, in it for you. So that's um, yeah, that's good to know. So yeah, I suppose yes, I suppose I could I could have should have said that up front. Um, and, and I know I know Apple is always shooting to satisfy. Like they're always going after the eighty twenty rule. So if eighty percent of people love what's coming out, it's good. And uh, that does ne not necessarily include photographers like us who want more, uh, let's call it purity in their photos, you know? Um, yeah, it's right. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I've, I've killed a lot of pixels in my time, right? So I wouldn't ever consider myself to be a purist. But uh, if I'm taking a base image, you know, yeah. uh, and, or, or just a snapshot, I do like it to look, and I know this is the worst possible word to use, but I do like it to look natural. Or, or reasonably <laughs> natural. I know, you know. I know. There's a stupid thing to say. You but know, I find it means that the, it means you are older than forty, and you. Um, I am you older have, than forty. You have grown up with with uh, other cameras than what uh, the kids the kids today grow up with. Yeah, and and yeah, of course, you know, it, people, yeah, you know, it 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 is weird, isn't it? Because of course, if you think about you know how film renders images that's anything but natural right but but it feels natural because your brain is trained to recognize it i suppose in a way yeah. but the the, the uh, i do prefer reasonably let's let, maybe not natural then maybe let's say neutral maybe let's say neutral processing uh uh you know not 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 too much you know hdr or not too much you know color bias one way or the other and things like that and i find uh, you know, uh, or, or sharpening and I, and I find there's 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 a lot of processing in in the current iPhone image pipeline that that I then just don't like the result of. So, but but you're right. I mean, uh, um, uh, do you have a grip then for your iPhone? Do you put a grip no, on your, because, uh, the Bluetooth? Because, shutter? No. no, because ergonomics are. I'm I'm totally fine with the ergonomics that a smartphone gives me. Uh, okay, fair enough. So that that is not a factor for me, not mm. a real one. No, okay, that's in, that's that's a very valid point. Very valid yeah. point. So yeah. anyway, it's um, interesting, isn't it? Very personal, very subjective. Oh, very, very subjective. The 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 one that the one camera, even though no, no, it doesn't. It's not for you. I was thinking Ricoh GR3, which oh, yeah, yeah, or oh, no, the well, 3X. It, the it 3X, has a I would fixed lens though, and it doesn't give you any telephoto. I think. No, so I did have. You may remember a few years ago, I had for a while the Fuji equivalent, which is called the XF10, I think, which is a pocketable fixed lens, twenty-eight mil equivalent, um, roughly. I think it was an eighteen and a half millimeter lens, um, and that I did. I did find very useful. Um, ultimately, I didn't find it very enjoyable to use. Uh, and at the time when I was clearing out all my cameras that I didn't use, I sold that one. Um, I don't feel any inclination to buy it back. Um, the GR3X, though, which is the 40 millimeter equivalent, that is interesting to me. Um, I have a it, funny story. That's a, that's a that's a focal length that I I that I would be closer to, you're yeah, more comfortable with. 
Um, so I have thought of there's actually this is another thing because I own the Fuji 27 millimeter pancake ish lens. Mm-hmm. I have thought about buying one of the very small Fuji bodies as a second Fuji uh, camera and then just plonking a lens I already have onto it. But again, that would that would give me the GR3X equivalent, but not... And it you know. would keep you in the same universe, because uh, being switching back and forth between brands is also a bit of a... Uh, yes. it, it makes things more difficult than it has to, because you will have to relearn different interfaces, and you won't... You, you will miss out on a lot of intricacies of the cameras, because you won't want to know all the details about both or three cameras. Exactly, systems. yeah, absolutely. Now, I have a fun story about the Ricoh GR3. <clears throat> so, I'll go on. not necessarily related, but uh, I think this is a good place to put it. Um, I know a guy who who wanted to have a proper camera and he, he, he spent, he used to shoot with an SLR like in the, in the 90s or something and then uh, gave up on that and shot pretty much exclusively with smartphones since then and uh, ended up uh, wanting a proper camera again because of the look of the pictures and comes down to sharpness, bokeh, these kind of things. So, um, uh, and we, uh, we as, as in the community around my German podcast, Happy Shooting, we, uh, we went on to a, on to a, a finding mission for him and we oh, ended okay. up presenting presenting him a couple of choices after discussing in a forum and so on and it was a real <laughs> elaborate kind of deal and uh, uh, he ended up going for the Ricoh GR3 because that was pocketable enough and had the right focal length and the right image quality and so on and uh, he used that for a couple of months and then he re- <laughs> and then he realized that it didn't have GPS built in, which he, oh, okay. which he assumed because he, he he doesn't live in that universe. Mm-hmm. He d- assumed that every camera has GPS built in nowadays, <laughs> and uh, ended up with like you have to you can sort of sync with an app that runs on a smartphone, but then of course that uses more more power because it has to have GPS running all the time and and so on. So and the, and the Bluetooth is always active between the, and it's, it's a and it's clunky and so on. So. Um, he ended up sort of not liking it anymore, even though it takes amazing pictures because of his oh. expectations that were completely not met in that regard. And this is a <laughs> point that is super, super important for him. Yeah. So I found this really funny. That I mean, and, inter- and, yes. and sad in, in, a, in another respect because he, now he's not very happy with the camera that we recommended. Yeah. He does realize that he should have probably asked for this, but... Anyway. I wonder. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I should think about that because the Olympus Tough camera that I've lost has GPS. It has a compass. The I question is, how bar- important a barometer. is GPS for you? How do you a- approach your photos? Do you go through through uh, maps and look at the p- the pins on the maps where the photos are and the the kind of the Apple? Not approach? not really. Not really. I mean, it tends to be if I want to think of you know images from a certain trip i've been on or something like that it can be useful to see them collected together but because i use a range of cameras and most of them don't have gps i don't use that as my primary way of of finding things anyway i mean i I tend to be pretty good at you know when i've been on a trip and i load all my images into the computer i just make an album and so if I want to say, OK, yeah, I went to New York in 2017, I'll go to the New York 2017 album and I will find all the relevant stuff. Um, so I don't particularly use the GPS. Um, so given all the all the different cameras and all the different arguments that are heard now, I think you kind of stay with the tough camera. You think I'm gonna? You think I'm gonna I do think, that? Because it's, okay. it's like you know, it's it's like an old sneaker. It fits well. You doesn't. You have to, don't have to relearn anything. You know what to expect. It does what you need it to do. Um, you have accessories that already sort of fit, um, and uh, it's not super expensive. So if the image quality is good enough for you, and if it serves all the other purposes, that's the honestly that's the one I would probably go with. Yeah, you're probably right. My my head says yes. You're right. My heart 
you says, want something buy, new. Buy three, want... actually. My, my, my heart says buy that one, right? Because that one is a great camera and it's a great walking around camera. And it's also one that everybody in my family uses, you know, so yeah. when we go on holidays and things like that and trips, you know, everybody you are, uses You it. are an Olympus Tough family. We, we 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 are we are yes although not at the moment um the uh the my my heart says buy the nikon one system and use that for some kind of project because it's it's right. cheap enough that you could get a system for very cheap and use it for a project and if you didn't like it afterwards you could ebay it and get most of the money back um so so that's what that's that's where my heart is and then there's a middle ground that says actually um buy uh a fuji compact most uh, a used fuji a small fuji camera that can put my pancake lens on it and then you know if i want to have a better technical image quality right that the in a pocketable thing for a day i can put a, a fixed focal length pancake lens on it still fits in my pocket in fact i could have two pockets right i could have an a, a, <laughs> i could have an olympus in one pocket and a fuji in the other pocket and and i'd still I, and i'd have the best of all worlds wouldn't i all right. But my heart really wants to love the Nikon One system. I, I, I from the day it was released, I've always wanted it. It was ridiculously really? expensive at the time for what it, what you actually got, especially I the was, lenses. I was and always put off by the by the tiny sensor in it. No, I, I, it I don't. Have a, I don't mind about that. I don't mind. Yeah, about I know. That. I know it doesn't really matter because you look at the tough camera. That sensor is not. It's probably smaller than in the Nikon. Oh, it, yeah, oh yeah, way smaller because yeah. the Nikon yeah, yeah. one is a one inch sensor. The tough camera is a one over two thirds right, or right, something right. like that. So it really is very small. So yeah, this is not really a valid argument. It was just one of those not really those what those gut feeling things that are not really informed by by facts. So yes, we don't have a solution, but you will very likely keep us updated when you make a decision. I so. I will do so. I, I do need to leave it a little while longer to see if the TG4 surfaces. Um, oh, uh, okay. And so it, so it may well be that, you know, when I next go into London, I have to stop by the lost property office in the railway station and pick up my camera. That, so well, that, 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 would, that would be the next step. If, if it comes back to you, then that whole episode was in vain, right? Yeah, but it's, but, but we, we, we love, toys right we're photographers know, we love our cameras and things like that so so a conversation about what new camera ha to buy uh -huh. how dare you say that conversation is in vain <laughs> that could never be true there is no world there is no in universe where this conversation is not valuable <laughs> very very good so to add even more value to this episode let's move on to our picks of the week um and uh, I'll throw mine in, which is myself. Hey, look at this. There's a video <laughs> out, which um, is me talking to an astronomer, Meredith Rawls. She is an astronomer at the um, at the Veracy Rubin Observatory and uh, is um, especially dealing with things like satellite light pollution for astronomy or in astronomy. We're talking about mm. all these um, new constellations that are being shot up in the sky. Um, uh, the Starlink stuff the, and things well, like that. Well, Starlink, OneWeb, and there's, there's a yeah, yeah. bunch of them, but Starlink is mm -hmm. absolutely the biggest at this point, and they are- Certainly high volume, isn't it, Starlink? Yeah. Yeah, and 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 even astrophotographers, that's why I brought it here in the, in the episode, even astrophotographers have um, raise concerns about those photos being sort of polluted by some of the artifacts that you get. I mean, these things have metallic surfaces. They reflect light. They have uh, solar panels that reflect light. And if they have the proper angle, then and and it's dawn or dusk, the sun is is under the horizon but not mm -hmm. gone. That will still strike those solar panels and uh, reflect light back to you and you can see that in photos and uh, there are mitigations in terms of like painting them black or adding visors that mask some of the of these um, reflections but it's still a thing and and astronomers are hit harder than astrophotographers I would say because as an astrophotographer you're kind of used to stacking photos and taking out the ones that have I know I don't know, um, airplanes on them and stuff like that. Um, astronomers do that too, but now they have to do it even more. And uh, 
it's a whole it's a whole very complex topic and um I'm so torn because I'm just a fan of having internet everywhere, fast internet everywhere <laughs> on this planet. And uh, so, and I did test Starlink here in Germany. And uh, on, at, at the same time, it does not, it, it's not free of issues. And No, uh, but it is very important to bring the internet to people that don't have access to it otherwise, oh, absolutely. isn't it? So, 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 so culturally <clears throat> and for inclusivity gl at a global level, it's a hugely important oh, thing yeah, to have. I'm, I'm with you there. And uh, the, on the other hand, I'm also with the scientists who are yes. <laughs> kind of... Um, Luckily, they've got a massive new telescope that must be the other side of the Starlink network. Oh, very much the other side, but um, that took... 20 years to get off the ground literally yeah at least but it's so, a good one though apparently the, this this is the web telescope of course which i know you know yeah. far more about than i do but you know the from from the news articles i see it's now fully calibrated and 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 performing quite nicely they are they are there's they are still a few months out till it is is going into full production but the the, the the mirrors have been aligned and the focus has been established and so on it's quite amazing to see yeah but there i mean there's there's things like full sky surveys to find asteroids that come tumbling towards earth that you <laughs> don't look up yeah. <laughs> want to do from earth and the, the, anyway so there's this um it's a it's a it's a 45 minute discussion with her which brings up a whole lot of information and and aspects that i was not aware of until that point that's so, good well i wasn't aware of that show that you've done so i will now go and watch that <laughs> That is, yeah, it, it was, it was, it was fun, and um, I'm very grateful that she took that chunk of time out of her busy day um, to talk with me about this. So that is online. Link is in the show notes. It's on YouTube, and um, yeah. And uh, your pick of the week is oh, oh oh well, my pick of the week is I, I'm finding really interesting. So it it is a book and uh, and more than a book. Um, so uh, it is called uh, Stereoscopy, The Dawn of 3D. And it is a full color, beautifully produced book that comes in a box set with a, uh, a stereoscopy viewer. So you, know, you look through it with both eyes and at two pictures. And as your brain aligns the two pictures, suddenly they pop into, into 3D. <laughs> um, uh, so I haven't had a chance to read all the book yet. There's a huge amount of historical detail you know, right, you know, through Victorian times and you know, uh, the early days of, of uh, the early days of photography uh, right the way through to you know the 1940s and 50s um you know uh, uh you know stereo photography was, was stereo far more stereoscopy is today. is almost as old as photography itself i mean it's mm -hmm. amazing what they've done and and has fascinated generations after generations yes so so the, the link in the show note uh is is to 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 a book but the, it's, it's on a website called londonstereo.com and there are there are two people behind uh, uh this who who one who wrote who both wrote the book um one of whom is is very much an expert uh and is uh is uh, dennis pellerin um if, if i've got the pronunciation correct um, and the other one, who is probably more famous globally for being a guitarist than a photographer, um, uh, I'm referring here to Brian May, who is the guitarist in the supergroup, legendary supergroup Queen. Um, yeah, and uh, but and he he's into stereoscopy. Has, that is amazing. He, he is has been for many years, um, and he uh, in in a lot of the time when Queen were touring as a band all around the world, he took stereo cameras with him and made a huge doc, you know, documentary archive of, of stereo images of, of the band and and of the things that they encountered on their travels. Um, and he is the co-author of this book with Dennis Pellerin. Okay, um, so. Um, he's obviously not. Stuff. He's obviously not into typography. Looking at the cover of the book, but that doesn't really. They, they very that much. very much leaned into the whole sort of you know Victorian salon aesthetic, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is not. Uh, but and and a lot of the images in the book because it has a lot of um, stereo printed images in the book that you can view with the viewer that comes in the box set. Um, um, but it's just fascinating. It's, it really is just fascinating. Um, and it's a different look on photography um, and uh, very much worth a look because of that. Very cool. So that brings us to the end of this episode. Um, 
It's been fun. Are we, I are feel. We, are we going to see you buy a new camera? Are you going to get your camera back? It's like it's a thriller. It's it's <laughs> the cliffhanger at this point. It is so. a cliffhanger this week. It's definitely a cliffhanger this week. Um, and we'll see. I I will report back not next week actually because I'm away at a photography event next week when we when we would normally record. But in right. two weeks from now, I will be back and I will have an update for you. I'm looking forward to that. It's it's going to be the GoPro for sure. Um, we are <laughs> online at okay. thefutureofphotography.com. You can find us at TFOP now on the Twitters. We'll be back in a week from now. Until then, everyone, take care and have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Hold up. 